Welcome back to another episode of the Isn't That Rich podcast. Today we are talking about grants. So at Farmer State Bank, we have customers come in all the time wondering about how they can receive extra funding, whether it's from the state or the government or how they can support their small business. And one of the ways they can do that is through a grant. A couple of weeks ago, Ashley and I went to the Heron Chamber of Commerce where they hosted a web or a seminar about grant writing and it was grant writing 101 and we realized that we had an excellent contact who knows everything there is to know about grants yeah. and so we wanted to bring her no pressure <laughs> we wanted to bring her on our podcast to kind of explain grant writing in the process and what a grant is because a lot of people don't know that they're even available um so with that i would love to bring on today's guest tammy gwaltney welcome tammy oh my goodness thank you so much for having me here what an exciting topic i know so tammy i want to know how the heck did you get into this how did you become an expert in grant writing first of all Um, can you explain a little bit about your background sure um out of necessity that's mm-hmm. how I learned to write grants and learn all about them. So, uh, you know, my path, my journey, just as a, a brief intro, is I'm a kid from Southern Illinois. I was born and raised in Heron and knew pretty early in life that I'd go out and, quote, save the world. Like, I, I knew that. I knew I was going to do that in some way, shape, or form. So fast forward, I got my background in social work and um, went on to run nonprofits. Well, the way you survive in the nonprofit world is you have to know how to write grants. And at least back in the day when I was in grad school, we had like a class on grant writing, but no one really taught you how to do it. So when you got out into the world and you were the director of a nonprofit and people like things like getting paid and (laughs) having the utilities turned on to serve our clients and those types of things, like it was just a crash course. Like you just had to figure it out. And like all fields, the grant writing and the grant world evolves and changes and ebbs and flows and all those things happen just like in anybody's industry. But um, I learned very quickly, once you were able to know how to write for uh, funding and once you started getting it, you became quite in demand. Mm. I could see that. Mm. Yeah, you became in demand. And so um, 170 years later in this (laughs) field, (laughs) um, I've learned a lot and you had to learn the hard way. It was, I tell people it's like, and folks in the for-profit world who start like a small business, right? You can go to some classes and you can get some pointers, but you have to be in the muck and the mire and you've got to, do it right and do it wrong and have good days and have bad days. And then pretty soon you're like, I got this. Right. And then you're able to help bring other people along. Right. And now what seems so hard to them is so clear to you, Mm. but you have to give them time to, to get there. So that's to me, like what the grant world is like for people who are trying to get involved. It's overwhelming. It, It, the, the wording, the language, there's a whole culture that goes with grants and um, you have to know how to get through all of that, get through the weeds to get to the information you need to help you in your situation. Yeah, it seems like grants, when you talk about them, they seem almost unattainable (laughs) to regular people or even people in business or nonprofits. So I'm excited to learn all the tips you have for us today (laughs) for sure one of the things we before we started recording this episode and i wish we would have been recording because you said something about people think that what is it it's not a you're not making a proposal yeah it's just the use of the word grant yes i mean the correct understanding of the word grant is the grant is the money you receive if you successfully write a proposal. So it's really proposal writing. The grant is the funding. So when you say you're writing a grant, you're writing a proposal to receive to get a, a grant. grant. Yes. That makes sense because yes. I really didn't know mm-hmm. what was what that would look like. So Yes. 
So what exactly, can you explain to us in the most simple terms that you have, what is a grant? Because I mean, is it just money that the government gives you for a specific reason or what is it and where does it come from? <laughs> yeah, that's the magical part. Right? I want to know where it comes from. Where's all this money coming from? Exactly. Where's all that money? Mm. Well, the easiest way to explain it is that Grants can come from a number of sources or funding, but we'll use the word grant as in that common language that most people use it in. So okay. it can come from local sources. It can come from state. It can come from federal. It can come from private. Mm. So there's sort of four places where those funds typically sit. And the access to those funds is different depending on who the funding source is. So let me give you an example of that. Um, lots of people in the particular, I'll start with the nonprofit world because there are grant funding for both for-profits and not-for-profits. So in the, in the nonprofit world, let's say somebody goes out to every local business up and down the street in the town that they live in. You guys as a bank know this happens. There are lots of great organizations out there in the nonprofit world. They're all doing lots of wonderful things, but they knock on your door hundreds of times mm. a year. You guys get requests for, quote, funding. In the nonprofit world, I wouldn't necessarily call that a grant because unless there's some sort of <clears throat> application involved where there's a screening process where the funding source is looking for certain things like, are you a 501c3? Uh, what is this money going to be used for? Da, 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 da. If there isn't some sort of application to fill out, I don't really consider that a grant. I consider that a donation mm -hmm. or a charitable gift. Some businesses, because they are so bombarded, are now starting to put applications attached to those. And charities are probably not going to like that I say this, but I highly encourage all businesses to do that, yeah. to have some sort of <clears throat> excuse me, screening process to get those funds. Because one, it's a tracking device for you as an organization to keep track of where did your money go, what did you uh, do with those funds, et cetera. So that's not really a grant. Sometimes that's called a charitable gift or just a donation. Each level that you go up, that process starts to get a little more involved. Mm -hmm. So let's say now I'm going to go to the state of Illinois that they have money. And there are sites, um, again, lots of terms that I'll use that's called GATA, G-A-T-A. And that's the state of Illinois site where you go to to see where every single grant that's available out there to apply for is sitting on that site. And it gives you tons of information. Who's the department that has it? When did they release that application? When is that application due? And then there's a link to what we call the NOFO. And this is the word with <laughs> yeah, There's a lot of acronyms. There's a lot grants. of acronyms. <laughs> and that stands for the Notice of Funding Opportunity. So when people say, have you read the NOFO or did you look at the NOFO? That's what they're talking about. And that's like the instruction manual for getting those funds. When you go to the federal level, now it's getting even more complicated, that application. These are federal dollars, okay? So state tax dollars, federal tax dollars are going for these funds that people are trying to apply for. So that's where my taxes are going. That's right. Yeah. So Jill and I have this conversation about the government all the sets stuff aside for yes. this. That's where some of my taxes are going. Some of them. And some of them are, and again, this is where it gets really complicated because at the federal level, those <coughs> grants show up on a place called grants.gov. And that's where all the federal grants are listed. Oh my goodness, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of grant applications. Some will go to like universities for research. Mm. You know, I told you before the podcast started, I'm sitting here fighting allergies. Oh my goodness, I hope there's lots of research money out there to help <laughs> people with allergies. Right? But there's all kinds, and that's where our, our universities and our research institutions get most of their funding to solve medical issues or whatever is happening in our society. Right. And those are highly competitive dollars. Like, I'm not, just not going to go out there and in two days write a proposal and be like, oh, they gave me $18 million. Like, it doesn't happen like <laughs> right. that, okay? Doesn't happen like that. So those are, so you, again, you have federal, state, local dollars, or what I call private dollars. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there are many, many entities out there where you can go to do one-stop shopping around private monies, like private foundations, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, mm. the Annie E. Casey Foundation. All those that we've heard about before. All of those you've heard about before. Those all set out there, like there are different companies that put together all a listing of all of those and research all of those for you and give you the criteria for all of those. There are membership fees to belong to them. Typically, you're looking at maybe... $1,500, $2,000 a year to have one person have access to those. Okay, so that looks like you would apply for it for this to get used to that. So you'd have a username and password and log in. Mm -hmm. And it, can anybody go on, on and do that? Or as that, long as you subscribe and pay the annual fee. So you just have to pay to be mm -hmm. on to the private. To be on the private ones, yes. Okay. Now, some libraries in the area or maybe if you have like a community foundation they might own a subscription and allow you to come to their facility and do research that way but generally people who are really serious about finding funding will pay that fifteen hundred dollars you'll get a return on your It'll investment be worth it yeah you'll okay. get a return on your investment so those are sort of the four places you go to look for funding and then again there are sort of different criteria that start happening at different levels around um, that application process and and reading the details of that nofo i'll pause yeah what do you want to say <laughs> <laughs> i think that's I, a lot that was yeah. a lot of information well i think it's great that you even gave us just the websites because i remember when we were in the grant 101 <laughs> seminar and i was like the, I said, where do you even go? Like, do you type in grants online and it just pulls up all these websites? Like, how are you supposed to know that you're not being scammed on a website? Right. Or, or I think that's yeah. that's something that people need to know. Yeah. Or yeah. go and pay for that <clears throat> subscription. And if it's legitimate yeah. or not, that's yeah. that scares me. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's a very common one at the private level. It's called Foundation Center Online. Um so that's a pretty common one that people will use and subscribe to. Again, they charge you per each individual who will log on to that system. But like I said, generally about $1,500 is a, an entry level for one person to log on. But it is an amazing site. And like anything else, you will get as much out of it as you educate yourself about how to use that site, mm -hmm. right? To use that tool. So um, I love it. I love Foundation Center online. That's it's awesome. And we'll link that in the show notes too for people okay. if they want to refer that so that or refer back to that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. So we kind of know there are the four different levels. If you're looking for funding, that those are the places you go. Mm -hmm. How do you begin to know if you qualify yeah. for a grant? And, How do you know? What, yeah. What organizations qualify? Does everybody qualify? Yeah. So let me back up. Okay. If I can answer a different question first. Sure. Before you put time and energy into going to these sites, and this is what I see a lot of people do. They're like, oh, I'm going to go find grant funding. Funding exists out there. There's no doubt about it. And, and once you know how to do the research, you can find those. But if you are not even established as a legal, legitimate organization, mm. nobody's going to fund you. No one. So my my t-shirt shop that doesn't have an LLC attached to it's not getting grant funding is what you're telling me. Correct. I, I don't Ashley's have a t-shirt. proprietor <laughs> without <laughs> any registration is, is not right. going to get it. So not you do happen. have to register. So say you yep. are a business and you've registered with the state of Illinois, you have your LLC, your EIN number, all yep. that stuff you have to have before you even... Yep. Try to get funding. Right. Because okay. what's going to happen when you start going to these sites and looking for funding is they're going to start asking questions like, we're going to need a copy of your articles of incorporation. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's go with the nonprofit world first. We're going to need your bylaws. We're going to need your articles of incorporation to show that you are a legitimate business in the state, wherever you have set up that organization. And then if you're a nonprofit, they're going to want to see your IRS 501c3 mm -hmm. designation. Again, more jargon, right? So they're going to want to see those things. And if you can't check up those boxes that you have those things, you're not even going to be allowed to apply. Yeah, you're not going to be taken seriously. You're not legitimate. You're mm -hmm. not legitimate. So why, how do they know the funds are going to be used for the exactly. way? Yeah. yeah, they're okay. not even going to talk to you. Yeah, They're going to say, come back when you have this. 
Now, a lot of these state grants we talked about, again, in the state of Illinois, I'm talking about strictly for the state of Illinois, because every state will have their own process. Right. But in Illinois, when you go to the GATA site, and I think I put that on some of the notes I gave you with the GATA. It's so funny because when we were in this, I'm just thinking back to when we <laughs> sat down at the, I was like, the GATA, the GATA, and I'm thinking G-A-D-A, GATA. Uh, you're no, on GATA.com. It's G-A-T-A, <laughs> and you did say that earlier in yeah. this episode, so yeah. G-A-T-A, yeah. GATA. I think it says we're like Grant Account- Accountability and Transparency Act. Yes. So, at any rate, on that side, or when you start to look at state grants and federal, they're going to say to you, are you registered with GATA? And are you registered with um, SAM.gov? Oh, a new term. Oh, yep. another new term, that SAM.gov. Is. That's the federal government registration site. Once you've proved you have documentation as a 501 and a state entity. So those two caveats are sitting right there on all of those no foes. And people skip right over that to start looking at, look at all the money we can get. Ooh. Look at all the money we can get those organizations are not even going to look at your application because you haven't fulfilled the two basic things you need, which are registration with your state and federal. So there's government. two easy things that you can do. It doesn't take long to do file your, it, so. it won't take long to do as long as you have your paperwork. In right. Order. Right. <laughs> exactly. So yes. And pe- like I said, people skim right over that and just go to the, look at all this money mm. that's available. And I'm like, yes, it's just not going to be available to you because you don't qualify. Mm. So now let me get to your question about who can apply and blah, blah, blah. Within the NOFO, when I'm looking at funding for whatever organization or individual I'm working with, if I know they are registered with SAM.gov and got and I've got verification that all of those ducks are in a row, then the first thing I'm going to do in that NOFO when I'm doing my research around whatever they're looking for, I'm going to go to this little box on that form. Now, that NOFO may be five pages. That NOFO may be 105 pages. Depends. Mm. I know. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> I know. I know. Nope. <laughs> so what's going to happen is there's going to be a paragraph pretty early on or even in the index remember in school how the teacher told us to look at the index yep. and see where stuff is it's going to say eligibility page whatever go to that page get to that first go to that page and if you do not see a description of your entity there move on because it might say something like this is only for um private colleges of higher education so if you're not a private college of higher education you're not eligible to apply so you might as well move just on move on move on <clears throat> yeah move on and i i'm going to add to that i when we were in the grant 101 thing we keep going back to that but kim watson was saying if you're going to apply for these like they're looking so specifically to give it to a specific person or a project or purpose they're not just going to be like oh i know tammy yeah we'd love to fund her <laughs> research project Gosh, she's nice she's it was funny. Only that easy i know right <laughs> so yeah when you say that yes you definitely need to make sure you're absolutely because then you're just wasting time too and it's yeah you're wasting a lot of your time because these applications especially again at these private foundations state and federal these are intense applications and if you put all this time into it and you hit the submit button, as soon as that, what they call the reviewer sees that, the person who's going to review your application or screen it before it gets to the reviewers, mm-hmm. they're just going to delete your application because mm. you're not eligible. Yeah, they don't care if you wrote a 20-page proposal they do not over care. it. They do not care. Wow. So once you do find something mm-hmm. in the the NOFO mm-hmm. that you call yeah, like which acronym like, do which I pick to make sure you. I'm saying the right you, you I'm trying said. to understand it yeah. it's hard it is there's it's just hard. a lot and we can there's include these lot. all these acronyms you gave us a list that's amazing that we'll include in here but so once you do identify something that you might qualify for and mm-hmm. you start the process what are some other things that a typical grant mm-hmm. proposal should include or that you'll need to Mm-hmm. Include in that. Yeah. yeah. The second thing I look for yeah. <laughs> in the NOFO is I look for the section in that index, again, that says 
are there matching funds required or is there a match that's required? That's interesting. I didn't even think about that, that you as a business or nonprofit have to come up with matching funds. Sometimes, yes. Okay. So what you're going to look at is if, and people again will go right to, look, we can apply for a million dollars. There's a million dollars. Well, when you go through and read that NOFO and it says like, is a match required? And it might say yes, 50%. Mm. So if you have a half a million dollars that you can prove to them that you have, they will probably give you a million dollars, but you're putting half of that on the table. Okay. Now, sometimes it'll say cash or in kind, and then it starts giving you a definition of what is in kind. Mm. What does that mean? Because what it means on one grant application is not what it means on another. And they'll tell you, here are the things that are allowable to use as an in-kind match. Staff, land, you know, whatever that is that they might come up with. But again, even if you're saying, well, yeah, I'll just put that I'll use staff as a match. Mm, they're going to do this thing called audit you. Auditing. <laughs> yeah, we know, we know as a bank a little something about that. <laughs> But, and uh, you better be able to prove <laughs> that that really happened because if not, they can recall those funds and you will pay those funds back. Wow. I didn't think of that. Yeah. So they don't just dump it in your bank account. I mean, no, 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 no. 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 And what is the purpose of having that 50% match? Is it just to show that you are dedicated to this process and you actually have some skin in the game. Is that what it kind of is or is it? Yeah, that's part of it. You know, and part of it, it again is, hey, if I'm a, a brand new entity trying to get off the ground and you gave me a million dollars, but I don't have any way to, again, put some skin in the game or dog in the fight or whatever that mm -hmm. terminology is we're going to use. The organization's going to, the reviewers are looking at that like, can this person manage these funds for what they're saying they're going to use them for, do they have the organizational capacity to manage these funds? Mm. Right? And that's really critical because as the funder, they are looking to give their money to the people who can do what they say they're going to do. And if you're like a one person operation, but you're starting this nonprofit to serve XYZ situation out there, but you don't have staff, you don't have resources, you don't have anything to support you in that process. As the reviewer, I've got to look long and hard at that and go, as one person, are you going to be able to pull this off? Now, in your proposal, you may have demonstrated to me how you're going to do that. But most people just see the dollar sign around the money and not the work that the implementation is going to require right. of them. Right, that's interesting. I don't know if that mm. answered the question. No, it did, for sure. Yeah. I have lots of questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel like my mind. <laughs> um, how do, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but are <clears throat> the state and um, the private entities, like how are they deciding their maybe no foes or like what they're going to give money to. Mm -hmm. Do they do research and see what is maybe needed in our country and in our states or for our businesses or how, how does that work? Does that make sense what yeah, I'm saying? Absolutely. No, the answer to that is it can depend again on a lot of things. So let's just go back to, let's use probably the most prominent uh, private foundation that's out there. And there, they have more than one, the Bill and Melinda Gates the foundation. Um, and just a little tidbit about how to find how much money sits in all foundations without um, going to one of these, um, like Foundation Center. If you just go to the IRS.org, there's a whole charity there that's, or a whole tab there that says charities and nonprofits. And when you click on that, you can search any charity that's registered because they've all had to file 990s, which is the tax return that charities file. And in that 990, it shows what the assets are in that. <laughs> in that. I show this to, I, I teach part-time at SIU and the social work program and a couple of my classes, I show them how to use that site and I always pull up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And when they see the first sheet, which is income and expenses, they're like, how many commas are there? Like, mm, yeah. what? <laughs> How is there that much money in a 
Foundation. Yes, yeah. it, it. We're talking billions of dollars, right? And my students, I'm like, remember how they taught us to count back from you know, <laughs> the right and con- and they're like, oh my goodness. So that is a private foundation. They can use their money for whatever they want, right? It's their money, mm-hmm. okay? So what they do is, let's say the Gates family has a particular interest. Like over the years, they've been really interested in people just having access to like purified water and they give money all over the world to charities to help villages all over the world have purified water so um it could be something as as simple as that as complicated yet as simple as that right so private foundations can do whatever they want with their money as long as that's what they said in their bylaws when they're <laughs> they said do. that they were going the to do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when they that they're following their own rule book, that's what those bylaws are. They're your governance. Okay. Who sits on your board, all those ways that you're governed as a charity. So that's one way that private foundations do that. Right. It mm-hmm. could also be um, a trust that a, a local person has. Say maybe they were a school teacher forever and they want to make sure their school Um, where they taught for 30 years, always has money for students, so they set up a trust. And maybe they leave that trust with a bank to manage the funds, Mm -hmm. but they have designated all those funds to go to a particular school. Mm -hmm. I'm at the Heron Education Foundation. That's where I work. We have a perfect example of that. There was a gentleman who left a substantial amount of money. He left it at a local bank. That bank gives us money every year to distribute us scholarships. How wonderful, Mm -hmm. right? In perpetuity, this is going to be funded. Like, amazing. So that's how private foundations decide what to do with their money. Some of them will do that based on research. Like the Annie E. Casey Foundation, again, a very well-known private foundation. They love giving funds around the protection and care of children. So any given year, they're giving away millions of dollars for money to support children but maybe one year it has this type of focus and next year it'll have that type of focus so they can shift sort of what that focus Mm -hmm. is based on their desire again it's their money at the state level that can be very different it may be like an ongoing issue that the state is experiencing and they want to make funds available to nonprofits or for profits to try to address that issue so that could be the way the state has decided that. Okay. Same thing with the federal government. Or they may hear from 10 universities around the country that here's an ongoing issue we're seeing again with, you know, some uh, like cancer. And if there could be some funds set aside, they're on the cusp of, you know, fixing this. And so the government will take a look at that through social policy and then laws are passed and funding is allocated and it goes through that whole process at the state and federal level to allocate Ooh. those funds. That makes sense. Did that answer your you question? You did. That <laughs> was a really good answer. Yeah. Okay. So it depends is the answer on whether it's state or public or private. Wow. And we learned also at Grant 101 that there are more <laughs> There, you guys got a lot out of that. Yeah, there's That's more there's our intro to green. Yeah, essentially. It wasn't us. I it was just so interesting. And I think as a bank, like we want to be a resource to people, not just to get loans, sure. but also to see funding in our area. And what she said was that she's never seen more grant money in her entire life. It ebbs and flows. Remember early on I said the grant world ebbs and yes. flows. So we're we're good right now. There's a lot of funding out there and that's good for the nonprofit world, mm-hmm. right? Which means it's good for the public because we're able to address homelessness or, you know, whatever that issue is. Um, you know, non nonprofits are usually typically struggling. It, yeah. it doesn't matter how big they are, or whatever. They're they're always out there struggling, um, trying to serve the people. Um, so it's always good yeah. for us when it's. Hey, it's at a peak, but we know, you know, what goes up must come down, down, right? right? That's right. And I always feel like the needs expand when it goes down. When it goes down. (laughs) Exactly. Yes, it does. Yeah. And let me say just a little bit, if you don't mind, about nonprofit, because one of the sort of the misunderstandings people have about nonprofits is that nonprofits can't have a profit. 
And that is not true. Mm. In fact, if like any business, if you're going to stay in business, you have to have some kind of a profit. The only difference between the nonprofit and the for-profit world is in the for-profit world, whatever you have profits, you can give back to your investors, your stakeholders, whatever. In the nonprofit world, it has to go back into the organization, right? But on a, a, a balance sheet or whatever you have that you're using for operational, you know, financial documents, you want to have cash <laughs> yeah. and you want to have cash flow. Um, you're going to have in those down times, you're going to have to draw on those resources. And so people sometimes have a misunderstanding about that. Like, well, why do nonprofits have this excess fund? Well, because they're going to have downtime too. Yeah. Or, like in your in the for profit world, right? You have depreciation around capital expenses, mm-hmm. right, or equipment. Well, we don't have that in the nonprofit world. You're not you're not allowed to have depreciation. So, in some of the charities I've run or the nonprofits I've worked for, we would have a line item in our budget called funded depreciation, which means I can't really. From a tax standpoint, it's not going to show up on a 990, but within a budget standpoint, I had to set sides, funds aside so when my copy machine died, I could go to that line and go like, okay, I've got $4,000 in there to get another copy machine. So we would call it funded depreciation. So again, if you don't have those funds there... You're not going to be here <laughs> two years from now. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Interesting. I didn't even think about that. That <laughs> nonprofits, that is a misconception that's out there. It is. Is that, yeah, it is still, you still have to run it as a business. It, it is, is a business. business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is a business. Okay. I have two questions about when you receive this money. Mm-hmm. One, do you get taxed on grant funding? And two, Not in the nonprofit world. Okay. But you do in the business world or in the for profit world? Um, it would depend on what your accountant says about it. Oh, yeah. what, what does John <laughs> Forbes say? Said, consult your tax advisor. Consult your tax consult advisor. Your tax advisor. Okay, yeah. Yeah. good to know. Yes. Two. Oh, go ahead. Let me just interrupt for a second. You're fine. Again, another misunderstanding. Nonprofits do pay taxes. Oh, that's, I have that misconception. Yes. Yeah. So we have payroll taxes, just like everybody else does. Okay, Medicare, all those taxes that have to come out. We we have to pay those. They're going to well. get you. We have to pay those as well. Okay. You All right. Sorry. First? Go ahead. No, you're fine. Go um, ahead. Can you take this <clears throat> these funds, your grant, and invest it? Okay. I, I don't know. Kind <laughs> of what the question you're getting at is: Is there regulation in how you use the funds? Like, can you? Yes, use it that to, would be the big general question. I'm just yeah. thinking, like, if you could take this money and then say, "I'm gonna throw it in the stock market and make more," that's probably not what you're allowed to do. But I just want to push the line. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Okay. So, any other questions? No. <laughs> no. So, again, in the proposal that you wrote. You told that funder what you You're were going doing. to do with that money. That's what you need to do with that money. Okay. okay. And you get audited. And like you, you get said. audited. Okay. Now, let's go back to like a local foundation in the area. Okay. So let's say uh, at, at a local foundation, lots of people are setting up different types of funds within their, like they, there are 20 different ideas out there and everybody doesn't want to set up their own charity so they go and stick money in a community foundation type organization it's okay if that organization is investing those funds but a percentage of all of that um, money that was earned would go back into each of those individual accounts that they got that so it's helping generate more funds for that account and keeping those alive if you will in the grant world, again, if I go to the state, uh, you know, Department of Economic Development and say I'm going to put in sidewalks in front of my nonprofit and they give me money for that, I use that money to put in that sidewalk. That's what I told them I was going to do with mm-hmm. it. And when they come to audit me and ask for receipts and all those things, I can verify that that's what happened to those funds. <laughs> Keep going. I'm not going to interrupt you because no. you're probably going to answer my question. No, no, go ahead. So what if I don't use all the funds? A Do great I have to give question. it back? That's a great question. Yeah. So again, it's it depends on how the funds were distributed. Some funders will say you can bill us every month. So every month I'm 
getting all my receipts together for whatever expenses I incurred for that project for that month, sending them to the funder, and then they're reimbursing me. So I'm never going to be, quote, overpaid because they're only reimbursing me what I could validate for them I spent. Mm -hmm. If they're giving, if they're fronting me some monies, if you will, and saying, well, we'll give you, you asked for $100,000, we are going to give you four installments of $25,000, then every month or quarter or whenever they want me to send in my billing and my verification, I'm going to have to show them how much of that money I've spent. Now, let's say I only spent 10000 that month and they still gave me twenty five dollars that next time because that's what they said they were going to do, right? I have a surplus from that prior quarter that I'm carrying over into that quarter as long as they allow that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's what I'm saying about grants is you have to understand all of this fine print because they may say, well, if you only spent 10, you have 15 left over. So we're only going to give you another 10 the next time. We're never going to have let you have more than 25,000. So that's what I'm saying about you have to read those right. no foes and bring you, the no foe and it's best <laughs> it, it's in your best interest of the founder of how you you know whatever project you yes. have going on to use those funds apparently in the way exactly. in a timely manner because otherwise depending on what that says you might not get as much funding as you were hoping for you might not it depends on what the funder says the rules are right. about that okay right. and all of them are different Right. That's why I'm like, even if you're like, well, I've gotten five grants from this same organization and this is how they've always done it. It doesn't mean that the sixth time they're going to do it that the way. way. Read the instructions. Mm-hmm. Read every single word in that nofo. Mm-hmm. Underline it. Highlight it. Sleep with it. Yeah. Wake up in the middle of the night and read it again. But you're responsible for adhering to that. And then they're going to send you a contract if they fund you, and you're going to sign that. That's a legal document. Okay. Okay. You're signing your life away. It is. I want to get back to our people because what we really want is to give our listeners tips for if they're going to write their own proposal and hopefully receive a grant. What are some tips for the writing process? I know you have kind of a list here. Um, yeah. Do you want to kind of take us through what that looks like? Some tips for doing that? Yeah. So again, if we're just going on the assumption that they have all their ducks in a row, the foundation is laid. They've got their state registration. They've got their federal registration. All of that's in a row. They've got EINs. They've got bylaws. They've got articles of incorporate. They've got all of those things at the foundation level. And now they're like, yay, we found this funding source and we're eligible and the, we can do the match, like all of those types of things. I'm going to go back to say, read the instructions because this is where people go awry. The funder may say, you have six pages double-spaced, Times New Roman, 12 font. And if you don't do that, they don't read your proposal. So it might be seem silly to you, but listen to the instructions down to font type and size. Don't do Arial 11. They're not reading it. Okay, that's a good tip. If they say those six pages... Um, you're not allowed to send attachments. Don't send them an attachment. Silly things like that could disqualify you. <sighs> not can, or will. You, will disqualify you. Will. Because okay. you think you're going above and beyond being like, oh, I'm going to send them the My attachment. My brochure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's yeah. me. That's what yeah. I would do. So, and, and I say this to people, I'm like, read the instructions. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm like, and I know everybody's into, you know, laptops and everything's electronic and you can hide on in there. I'm like, get a good old fashioned print out a copy of that and start with your highlighter. And because it's forcing you to read each word and then underline it, highlight it to get that into your brain over and over again. As many grant proposals as I've written over the years, I will read that NOFO many, many times before I start to fill it out. Because the other really significant thing in that NOFO is the scoring criteria. So every NOFO has a scoring criteria that says this application is worth X points, 100 points. And this is how we're going to score them. 10 points is going to go for you answering these types of questions. 
30 points is going to go to this type. So if you spend all of your time in the 10 point section, you just out of those 30 points that next section, you get 10 of those, you only got a third of the possible points for that section. So you're looking at that scoring criteria to decide, okay, yes, I have to answer all of these well, but here's where the bulk of those points are going to come from. So it's almost weighted. Mm -hmm. And does, is that disclosed in a, oh, yes. a so it's that in the, in the instructions, it'll all be there. Mm -hmm. It's in the note. That's a good tip too. So look at what they're paying the most attention to and make sure you're explaining yourself under that. And that you answer the question. Okay. Good. And my nonprofit life, um, I've had many incarnations of that and so, so blessed to have worked in so many wonderful areas. But um, one of the fields I worked in, I had to go to court a lot and testify. And the attorneys would always tell you, just answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> right. And yeah. so that's what I say about the NOFO. It's like, just answer the question. Yeah. Right. Good. Don't tell them other things that don't pertain. So you would ask, like, what are the tips? And I'm like, so that's it. Read it. Read it. And also know how to tell your story. Okay, because if you can't tell your story, then the reader doesn't get a picture of what you're trying to do. And also use proper grammar. Yeah, wah, wah, boring, right? Mm. But if you have misspelled words, um, if you can't, if your writing is not strong, like you, you really struggle with sentence structure or how to get one paragraph to flow to the other, Get someone who is good at that to review that or read that before you submit it. That's a good tip. Have somebody proof it over and over again every time you make your edits before submitting. Yeah. And particularly if it's like maybe a former English teacher or something who has <laughs> no idea what work you do. But if they read it and go like, I, I don't understand what you're trying to get them to fund or I, I don't understand what mm -hmm. you were trying to say here. Don't take that personally. Like, oh, I need to up my game. Like, if I'm not explaining it, if they're not getting it, the funder isn't going to get it. Right. And it's not like you get a second chance to be like, oh, I'll explain it to them in person when they get my application. It's not like that. Like mm. You really got to paint the picture very clear and concise. That's what you learn in grammar. As per the instructions. <laughs> As per the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this day and age with a lot of uh, applications online, you'll get a box and it'll say you have 500 characters. Mm -hmm. Ugh. And they mean characters like a period, a comma, that's a character. Yeah. Oh, I'm down to 490. Like, right. like you're panicking, right? Mm -hmm. And many times those of us, like you can tell I love to talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm like, my story, like I want to tell you my story. And it's like, oh no, I have like 5,000 characters and they gave me 500. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, editing is painful, but you have to go back and pick out the 500 most important things to put in that box. Yeah really forces you to think about your story. Yeah. What's your elevator pitch, right? They mm -hmm. always ask, how are you going to promote yourself? Get it down to that. So yeah. That's, that's good, too. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. What do you think about all of this stuff? <laughs> it makes me nervous, but excited. No, I want to write a grant now. I, I want to write a proposal. You want to write a proposal. Mm -hmm. there you I want to look through a NOFO, and I want to prove these people wrong that I can, mm. I can get the funding. And then I'm be like, just kidding. I just want to do it because I did a podcast about it. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, in the for-profit world, because we've talked a lot about the nonprofit, but remember, in the for-profit world, there there's grant funding as well. And again, grants in the simplest simplest of terms means money you don't pay back. A loan you pay back. A grant you do not. So for-profit businesses. Let me just use a federal um, agency as an example. So the USDA, right? United States Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. has funding out there available to private businesses, LLC, S corps, you know, whatever your business structure is. Uh, a lot of emphasis right now on solar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I want your listeners to hear me very clearly. This is not for individuals. This is for businesses. Right. Okay. So yep. if I own a say a farming operation and I want to put solar on that farming operation and I'm working with a local solar company to put solar there. They have funding for those business entities to help with grant funding 
for that solar operation. That's for private, privately owned businesses, right? So I'm not a nonprofit, I'm a business entity, but there is some federal grant money out there, like everything else, <laughs> because it's federal money. That business still has to go to SAM.gov. They have to get, oh, here's a new term for you. They have to get a UEI. If you do not have a UEI, you're not going to be able to apply for those funds. And you get the UEI through SAM.gov. Okay. <laughs> the UEI stands for Unique Entity Identifier. That is correct. It replaced what used to be called your Duns number. Yes. So, right? Okay. So most people know what Duns and Bradstreet is. You used to have a Duns number. Well, now the federal government is going to a UEI. So every organization, profit or nonprofit, has to get assigned a UEI if they're out there looking for funding. Okay. <laughs> I want to hear, so you've been in this world a while, Tammy. 170 years. I would no love more. to hear <laughs> some great success stories that you have oh. for grants that you received. If you're allowed to disclose that, I don't know. But sure. um, is there any story that you were you successfully navigated that you're really proud of? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Many. And, and again, anytime you have a, a large funding success, many people were involved, right? That um, many people. So our community college down the road, <laughs> yeah. I, I was there for about five years. I recently left to go to the, the Heron school system. Yay, Tigers. Yeah, um, love <laughs> that's my <laughs> alma mater. But um, when I was working there, um, you know, you look at most of the community colleges, right? Nationally, community colleges started developing in the 1960s for the most part. So a lot of their facilities were built in when? The 1960s. Yeah. Uh, technology's kind of changed since the 1960s and that sort of thing. So we went looking for funding for the career and technology centers, um, automotive repair shop, um, automotive paint, uh, HVAC, like all of those technical programs, welding. Those facilities were all really outdated and such. So um, worked with um, the federal U.S. Department of Commerce to get, I think at this point it was like four or five million dollar um, grant that's coming into the college to redo those facilities and or construct some of the newer facilities there. Wow, like that was a good day. Now, that took about a year and a half to work on that funding. Um, wow. That's a, that's a long time. A long time. This isn't some paper you write over the no, weekend. It's no, it's not an essay. It's a, it's a major deal. It's a major deal. And in this area, we have um, Greater Egypt Regional Planning. Uh, many people know Kerry Menace and the folks who work with him. And those types of projects, you're working collaboratively with an organization like that to help you maneuver all of that back and forth. Those are federal dollars. They're large federal dollars. They absolutely make sure you know what you're doing and that you can manage those funds once you get them and you have the appropriate accounting staff and architects and all those mm. pieces in place right but i love that i mean it's going to be a game changer yeah. for the students in yeah. this area for our community for businesses right, right. like businesses who need to know that the people who come out to work on your hvac system that these kids are in training facilities that are of the you know highest quality and all of that so those are fun like those are fun but they're also small smaller amounts of money that made significant impacts as well um all the years i worked with particularly with the abused children mm -hmm. um you know uh one thousand dollar donation that you get that makes sure a kid has um food and clothing yeah what's more rewarding than that mm -hmm. yeah yeah right Amazing. Yeah. or a family that's been waiting so long to adopt a child and you can finally help make that happen for them and it, it's just it's great it's a it's a crazy world to live in but a very rewarding world to to live in. I mean, I could listen to the stories you have all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but for the purpose, is there, for this podcast, are there <laughs> any resources in our community available besides the bank or is there anything besides that that people can start 
to look for grants. Mm. Again, if you are a for-profit business, I really encourage people to go to like the business incubators in the area, like um, over at SIU um, on the campus, past the arena. You know, we're in a small town. I don't know the name of any road. I just know how to tell you how to get there. Yeah. <laughs> right, go past the arena south on 51 and it's on the left. But that whole business development park, that they are there to really help support for-profit businesses like how do I put a business plan together? The bank said I need a business plan. How dare you banks want a business plan? <laughs> That's your version of telling people yeah. about a NOFO. Yeah. We need to know, do you have these types of things in order? And mm-hmm. right. Um, so I tell people, if you don't know how to do that, go there. Again, they have received state and federal funding. Mm-hmm to run those organizations so those services are free. So go there and get their expertise around that. Um, so that's a really good place for for-profit businesses to start. Nonprofits, again, I would say a couple things. <laughs> if you're a small nonprofit and you've got your paperwork and you're actually a, a legal entity, partner with an established nonprofit in the area and let them be the applicant and maybe make you a sub awardee of some funds so that they the money is coming to them but maybe they're contracting with you for a piece of some services that way you can start to get a feel for what is it like to manage it what is the reporting going to look like but you're not responsible they are right they're sort of overseeing you until you can start to understand how that works Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about starting a nonprofit, I can't encourage you enough to talk to all of us who are in that industry and really help you think through, is that something you really want to do? Or is there another way for you to um, meet that passion that you have without setting up a legal entity to do that? When you go to the state and federal sites, um, you can go and look up charities, ratings, Uh, The IRS.gov, the State of Illinois Secretary of State, Attorney General's Office, they have a list of nonprofits that are noncompliant. You don't want to be on that list. No, no. That's interesting. I'm going to go look at that after this episode. (laughs) I'm going to check it out myself. (laughs) But it's good to know that. And yes, and funders, I encourage people who, uh, you know, are giving away lots of funding through, again, donations or whatever. It's like, well, you can go to those sites and look up that charity who's coming to you asking for funding to see if there's a rating or are they in compliance, not in compliance, right? And a lot of people set up these nonprofits and then the person who started them, moves on or forgets to file paperwork or doesn't realize you have to file paperwork and then you're in yeah you're in bad graces with Mm. the state that's the last thing you want so it's a lot for a podcast it is is, but i want to ask you if people want to get in touch with you where do they find you i know you've got a couple really interesting things coming up in the new year so i'd like to just touch on that a little bit Yeah. yeah um Ashley Watson at the Heron Chamber of Commerce has asked me to do a follow-up to that, what you keep calling, I think, Grants Grants 101. Yeah, Yeah, because, again, in any workshop on grants, there's no way anybody can cover all of it in in one setting. So Kim did a great job and got everybody started, and then Ashley asked me if I would come in. I don't know the exact date off the top of my head, but if you go to the Heron Chamber site or uh, get in touch with Ashley, she'll be happy to put you on the mailing list and give you a heads up about that. So I'm really excited about that. Like, I love grants. I love the grant yeah, world. And you do know, you're so knowledgeable when it oh. comes to this. This has just been a joy to listen to mm-hmm. what you oh, have you. to say. So thank you for being on here. If thank you were to leave you. our listeners with one piece of advice when it comes to grant writing, what would it be? Just quick, first thing on top of your mind. Do your homework. Mm. <laughs> yeah, do your homework. Do your homework. There it is. Nobody Get the no, f- no no phone f- tattooed. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Final <laughs> words. I'll answer for you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tammy. This thank has just been you. a joy. Thank so you. Thank We've you. had a lot of thank fun. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. And we'll include all of this information in our show notes. <laughs> and thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. So, Jill, where? Do we go from here? Be sure to check out our show notes for this episode and also be sure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter. And we'll see you next week. See you next week.